people in your sight, O oh God, and none of my words are going to fall to the ground. But Lord, you have prepared the hearts of these precious people to receive your word today. And I give you all the praise and I give you all the glory. When I open my mouth, you will fill it. And I give you thanks. In Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen. Amen. The power of hope is my subject this morning or my text this morning. The power of hope. And the Lord spoke to my heart to turn to Jeremiah. He told me this. Turn to Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, verses 11 and 12. And I'm reading from the Amplified Version of the Bible. For I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Thoughts and plans for welfare and peace, and not for evil, to give you hope in your final outcome. And there is one translation that says, in your expected end. In your expected end. We need to know what we are expecting. Amen? He's going to give us hope in our final outcome. Then you will call upon me, and you will come and pray to me. I will hear and heed you. Then you will seek me, inquire for and require me as a vital necessity, and find me when you search for me with all of your hearts. Selah. The power of hope. Most people, beloved, give more importance to love and to faith, including myself over the years, than they do to hope. But I've discovered that that's not what the scripture says. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it says, now faith, and now abideth faith, one, hope, two, and three, charity, or love, three. But the greatest of these is charity, which is love. So if you're reading that scripture, since love is the greatest of the three, and hope is just before love, that means that hope is the second in, of greatness. It's right beside faith. Even above faith, hope is more powerful than we realize because faith is the substance of hope. If there's no hope, you can throw your faith out the window because it's not going to be there. And that's what the enemy is trying to do in many of our lives. If he can take your hope, you lose faith. When you hope and you really are hoping, believing for what you can't yet see, that's what, what generates your faith. It's like a generator. It's like a, 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 it's just like a, a, a force inside of you. But if you lose hope, you will not walk in faith. I can guarantee you this. I believe that another name for hope may be a positive imagination. And I'm going to show you this, I believe today, in the scriptures. Romans 8, 24 and 25 says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what, is a, man see, what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for it? If you've seen it, you don't have to hope for it. It's already there. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Is anybody here that's like me that needs some patience? Thank you. Here, the Apostle Paul was telling us, beloved, that hope is for something that isn't seen, something that isn't yet present. And once it becomes present, there's no longer any reason to hope for it. So hope means you're looking at something that you can't see. So you might be thinking, well, if I can't see it, how am I looking at it? You can't see things, you, you can see things only with your heart. And this is what I believe the imagination is. 
You're anointed imagination. You see with your heart. In Isaiah 26, 3, it says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. The word mind here is literally translated imagination. I'm going to say that again. In Isaiah 26, 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in you. The word mind here is translated imagination. Four other times in the Old Testament, it's the same thing. So we could quote this verse this way. The Lord will keep you in perfect peace when your imagination is stayed on him. And I quote Pastor Dave, my husband's favorite scripture, Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Whether it's for evil or whether it's for good. You see, beloved, a lot of Christians would reject the idea of imagination because they nearly always relate it to something that's childish. You know, a child imagines this and you listen to them and, and, you, and you, you literally say, oh boy, if I could just be like that. The, a child knows no fear. A child knows no concern. A child only knows trust. Trust and hope that that parent or that person, that adult that they're with is going to be taking care of them. And so we, when we talk about imagination, we, because we, all, we always think it's something to do with a child, you know, they're so innocent and they're so, they, they just don't know any better. And look at the things that they can imagine. As I was preparing for this message, the Lord spoke to my heart about an incident in my own life. And bear with me, I've told this story many, many years ago, but there's too many people here today that have never heard it. But it's a true story. And I realized as he was showing me this, that he does what, what he works behind the scenes and we can't see everything the way we think it's going to be. We only know that our heart cries out to God. That's why, you know, when King David was being anointed, all the brothers lined up and, and you know, the, the prophets and all, you know, he's, the, the prophet Nathan came and said, no, 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 none of these. Bring in the other one. Oh, he's just a lad. Bring him in. As soon as he laid eyes on David, he knew he was going to anoint him king. Why? Because he said, God doesn't look on the outward appearance. He looks on the heart. He looks on the heart. Thank God he looks on the heart and not all of our shortcomings and faults. Amen? Amen. So many, many years ago, well, I, can't, I don't want to date myself to be a hundred and something, but it was a long time ago. I was probably around 12 or 13 years old at the time, and my older, one of my older sisters, Jeanette, she worked as a, as a usherette in the theater in our town. It was a, a movie theater. And uh, as we were growing up, we would go in there, but she'd kind of sneak us up the stairs, you know, we didn't have to pay. And so, and funny enough, in this theater, upstairs was called the gods. And so, as a child, I would sneak in with Jeanette. She'd tell us a certain time to come and go up this way and I'll take you up that way and all this other stuff. I know it wasn't right, but still we did it. So I know you would never have done it, but I did. Anyway, so for weeks, there was a, a, a movie called The Jolson Story. And I was in that theater literally every night. After I'd come out of school, I'd meet my sister and she'd take me up the stairs and she'd say to me, Pat, are you not tired listening to this? I said, no, I could listen to this forever. And this Jolson story, Ilse Jolson was his name. He was a Jewish young boy and he became a great famous singer. And the story goes that as he was, you know, traveling through America and making his name and all the rest of it, in those days, there would be the front paper, you know, Jolson sings here, Jolson sings there. And I remember it like it was yesterday, beloved. I would sit in, and I'd watch this thing coming up on the screen and it would be a train and it would choo 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 and then the big screen would take over and say, Jolson in New York, Jolson in New Orleans, Jolson in Alabama, Jolson hits this, Jolson's there, Jolson's there. As a child, as God is my witness standing here today, 
I would watch that. And I never knew where America was in the map. All I knew was that for the first time in my life, I had met Americans because there was GIs stationed in this, at the town right next to us in the air base. And I never knew America. But as I was watching this as a child, I can remember it, and it was as clear in my imagination as it is today. I didn't realize it was my imagination. I didn't know it was my heart crying out, but it was. And I can remember looking at it and saying, I'm going to see those places. I'm going to see America someday. And I would think to myself, you're crazy. How are you going to get to America? How is that going to happen? And it wasn't until years later, beloved, that I realized God seen my future. And God put that in my heart to believe him. To, I didn't realize, but while I was sitting there watching this, he was working behind the scenes because my two older sisters were already dating the men that would be married then, and Chris and Vince got married, and they were the ones that brought me to America. I didn't realize it was at the exact same time that God was putting all of this together. God sees the beginning from the end. God knows. So this is not just a childish thing. We're all given this imagination. We've all been given hope for a future. God wants us to hope for the future. No matter how dreary or how, how bad it might feel right now, he wants you to believe him. Are you here today? So it's not just a, a childish thing. Your imagination is your ability to see with your heart what you can't see with your eyes. And you use this every single day. Now, fast forward to the 1990s. I'm in America, I'm pastor in a church, all of these other things. How, who would ever have believed it? I still, still wonder sometimes. I still shake my head sometimes. But there was a part of that movie when Al Jolson was in the Palace Theater in New York City. And he said, put up the house lights. And he was the first person that ever made a path all the way down the theater, a big, big you know, pathway, so that he, he said, I want to see their faces. And he would walk down this huge, big thing that he built in the middle of it, and he would be talking to this one and singing to that one, and that was where he met his wife. He started to sing to his wife, never seen her before. And I remember, as clearly as I'm talking to you, beloved, I said, someday I'll see that palace theater. And I was so engrossed with him singing and talking to people. I, and I'm saying to myself, that's what I want to do. Now, I know you don't want to hear me sing. I know that. But I'm saying as a child, I want to do that. Who would ever have thought I'd be doing it? I'd be doing it. I'm trying to tell you something. Don't ever give up hope. Don't ever give up on your dreams. That's what they said to, G to, to Joseph. Behold the dreamer, Thomas. Well, God still showed up at the end. Are you hearing me? And what the enemy meant for evil in his life, the Lord said he what? what Joseph said to his brothers, what you meant for evil, my God was working out for good. But I want to tell you, we're fast forward, fast forward. I'm on my way to Israel. And the, cup, the, the people that were with us, the, the leaders and what have you of the group, ah. Uh, I'll tell you who it was, Joanne Bunce and her church. And I'll never forget, she said to me, Pat, do you want to go to the Palace Theater? <laughs> Flashback. I think it was the Lion King or something like that. I said, yes, I want to go. So she started to tell me where all the seats were. I said, no, I want the box seat. I want up there. And the, I want to see it all. I want to see the tonsils. <laughs> and that's exactly what I said to her. And so, again, we get there. We get into the box seats. And I'm just telling you the truth, beloved. I know some of you think, oh, come on, Pastor. I don't really care. I'm just being me. I'm being me. Because I believe this stuff. 
And I'm looking down at that palace theatre. It didn't have the ramp and everything they had in Jolson days, but it was the palace theatre. And I started to cry like a baby. And I remember Pastor Dave saying, what's, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I was telling, oh, he said, that Jolson thing you're always talking about. I said, yeah, the Jolson thing, David. I said, well, here I am, and I'm looking at the Palace Theater. And to the day that he went to be with Jesus, he never did find out how much those tickets were. but I had waited for that too long to sit in the back. I want to give you encouragement today. There's nothing too difficult for your God. Now way back then, a child of 12 and 13 years old did not understand that her sisters that were 9 and 10 years older than her at that point were already dating the future husbands that would bring me here. Way back then, who would, I'd never have believed that I would have ever seen the, the palace theater, but it was in my heart. And I'm thinking and thinking and thinking about it. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Your imagination, beloved, is your ability to see with your heart what you can't see with your eyes and to use this every single day of your life. You may not have thought about it, I haven't thought about it much, but when I was doing this, I'm thinking, God, you're speaking to me. The, you might not know. You don't know how, how you're going to get home today if you didn't have an imagination. You know how you're going to go home because you're going to walk out this door, you're going to go into a car, you're going to start it up, and you're going to drive home. That's your imagination. It's because of your mind you picture your house and how to get there. You think in pictures. I think in pictures. You think in pictures. That's why props are so effective. Because you get more out of something when you can see it and hear it. And all your other uh, uh, thing, you know, all your feelings, everything about you, the more you put in, the more you understand. So, you think in pictures. An example would be this. If I said to you, Apple, you wouldn't see the letters A-P-P-L-E. No, you'd see an Apple. You might picture a red apple or a green apple, but I could refine that if I wanted to by saying to you, I want you to see a big red apple. And the more words I use to describe the apple, the clearer the picture would become in your mind. Now, whether you know this or not, beloved, you can think of something you can't picture you need to be able to picture something to truly comprehend it. So if you're believing God for something, and it seems impossible, he's the God of the possible. He said, with man this is impossible, but with me all things are possible. So you have to start believing you're seeing that before you have it. That's what Abraham did. He called those things that be not as though they were, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness' sake. You and I have that same ability within us. God said, let there be light. There was no light. Light had never been before. But God imagined light. And light is still today. Are you hearing anything today? You're getting something here. So you need to be able to picture in your heart, in your mind, your heart, whatever way you want. If it's up here and in, inside of you, picture how you want your life to go. Picture how you want this particular prayer request to end. Picture it and confess it and believe it. Mark eleven twenty three. Whosoever shall say unto that mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatever he saith. What's he talking about? Whatever you believe in your heart, you're going to have. Amen. Especially when you speak it out, whether it's good or evil. Praise God. Your imagination, beloved, is how you think. You cannot... 
You cannot think of something you can't picture. You think about what I'm saying. You thought about the clothes you were going to put on this morning before you put them on. You think about what you're going to eat before you order in a restaurant. And then when you see the menu, you know, that's it. That's what I'm going to have. Your imagination is how you think. Your imagination is how you meditate, how you understand and how you remember things. You really can't do anything without an imagination. People that don't imagine things, people that don't hope for things, they are in a state of hopelessness. They go into depression. They go into to, 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 to being, feeling terrible day in and day out. They wake up feeling bad. They go to bed feeling bad because their imagination has dried up. They are not hoping for anything anymore. They've lost hope. They can't imagine any good coming. Now, you know who I'm talking to here today. You know what I'm saying is the truth. And when all you do is surround yourself with negativity, and negative words, negative thoughts, and people of negativity and thoughts, that rubs off on you. And it's hard to get out of that. You've got to know what the word says, and you've got to stand. And when you've done all to stand, stand. I think Job said it better than anything I could ever say. Yet though you slay me, still I am going to trust you. And that's not easy. That's not easy. So you really can't do anything without an imagination. Because you imagine whether you... If you keep imagining, beloved, that you're going to lose that job, you'll lose it eventually. You see yourself, you've lost that job. If you keep imagining that you'll die of this disease, that your father and your mother and your grandfather and your grandmother, believe me, you better watch what you're saying. Because you're imagining it. You're seeing them lying in their deathbed and you're thinking the same things. I know. I've been there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So your imagination is how you think, how you meditate, how you understand, how you remember. You have to take the word of God and let it excite your imagination. That's why I read that scripture to you. I know the plans and the thoughts I have for you, saith the Lord. Plans to do you good and what you're expected end. And you say, well, Pastor Pat, what if it doesn't turn out the way you want it to? What if my life doesn't turn out the way I'm imagining and believing God for I don't have all the answers, but I think I would rather live my life expecting the best than expecting the worst. Amen? It says in Genesis 6, 5, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every every imagination of the thoughts of his, what? Heart was on evil continually. Do you know that's what happened at the Tower of Babel? The scripture's very clear. He made them, he, he caused them all to speak in different languages so that they wouldn't understand each other. And the word says that because the, nothing that they could imagine could be withheld from them. It's right there. And God knew that what they were imagining was for evil. So what this scripture is saying in Genesis 6, 5 is he's talking about deep thoughts, not just surface thoughts. You know, you think this and you think, no, I'm talking about something that's already ingrained into you now. You've been thinking about this and thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking and and you wake up in the morning thinking about it, you go to bed at night and I know I've been there. I'm still struggling in these areas. That's why I can talk to you honestly. Because I truly believe what I'm saying. It's talking about deep thoughts, not just surface thoughts. God deals with us on a heart level. He sees the imagination of our hearts. The reason I believe this is because a lot of people just don't think that imagination is that big of a deal. But it is. The Lord dealt with people according to the imagination of their hearts. And he sees your heart today. 
He knows the hurts. He knows the wounds. He knows the shortcomings. He knows when you're failing. He knows when you're doing good. He knows it all, but it's not by works lest any man should boast. That's why 1 John 1, 9 is in the scripture. If we repent, if we come, come to him and say, Lord, I'm sorry, he's quick and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that unrighteousness can be doubt and unbelief and all the other things that he sees in our hearts. We can get it to the surface, get it out and say, Lord, it's a new day every day in every way. I'm believing you, you are the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You know, either I believe this or I've been in Disney World for the last 40 years. If I didn't believe what I'm telling you, I couldn't stand here this morning. I'm walking by faith. Not by how I feel, not by sight, not by my feelings. Because you don't want to follow me home. You don't see me behind closed doors. You're nothing bad you would see, but you don't see me crying out to God. You don't see how unbelief comes to me. Trust me when I tell you. This is not easy. But we either believe or we don't. There's no in between. There's no turning, turning of variableness with my God. There's no shadow. He either, either his word is true or, and all men are a liar or I'm in, I'm in la la land. Hope is more than I want this to happen or I wish this would happen. Hope is your imagination. It's your heart level. Every time the scripture talks about imagination in a positive way, it uses the word hope. When Paul talked about hope, he was seeing things through his heart. He was taking the promises of God and through those promises, he was seeing God. He saw God cause him to succeed when everything else was going wrong. What did Paul and Silas do in the cave, in the, the jail? They sang praises unto God while the rats were chewing at their toes and their backs were bleeding with the scourging. What did they do? They put their hands up and they praised God. And the Bible says a great earthquake yeah. took down those, those walls. That's the time to praise them. When nothing's going right or doesn't seem like it's going right, that's the hardest time to praise them. Oh, we can all, I'll tell you, we talk about fair weather Christians. Come on, let's just be honest about it. There's a lot of Christians that have been, oh, wonderful, 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 wonderful. But the first rogue wave, you don't see them. I'm behind you, Pastor. Yeah, I know you're so far behind me, I can't see you. I'm just being honest. You'll never prove God is God if you can't stand the heat in the kitchen. When the tough get going, the going get t when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Not in yourself. You can't do this in yourself. And I'm not putting anybody's doubt or unbelief down. I'm there. I've been there. I'm struggling with this daily. What I'm simply saying to you is, arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. That is inside of you. The strength you need is not anything you can do. The strength you need has already been given to you. You need to draw from that well. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we love you. You love, we love you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I don't even know where I am. Happy with Jesus. So hope is more than I want this to happen. I wish it would happen. No, every time the scripture talks about it, hope is always told in a positive vein, always. So 
Paul was taking these promises, and through those promises, he was, God, he was seeing that God was causing him. Might not have happened just like this, but he was causing so many things we didn't understand. He didn't understand. You and I don't understand. And it's sad to say that most people, because they don't understand this process, and I'm only beginning to understand it myself. They don't understand how important this is. And they allow their imaginations to be controlled by other things. They allow their imaginations to be told, uh, to be controlled by the evil reports. And, and you know, your, 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 your child will never come off of drugs. And they imagine their child on drugs for the rest of their life. Oh, you'll never be able to get debt free. Then they imagine themselves ending up homeless. Or, they you know, or you'll never be, be healed of that sickness. And they imagine themselves never being healed. Because it's entered their heart. It's entered their imagination. It's entered their spirit. And when it's entered your spirit and you speak it, it causes life or death. Hallelujah. We allow our imaginations to control us by all of the outward Waves that are coming at us, whether it's TV, whether it's people. I mean, look at what we're hearing on television. It's, it's crazy, the times we're living in. I've had to train myself, and I'm serious with you, turn that thing off. Because the more you listen, I'd love to see somebody coming out, just one, just one person coming out. This is the good news hour. Start a TV thing. This is the good news hour. And give people, because all you're hearing is the bad. We don't hear about the good. And there's a lot of good going on in the world. But we don't hear it. We're bombarded in our imaginations. And we act out of that. So, when it's controlled by other things, they see themselves failing. They see themselves poor. They see themselves sick. But here's the good news. When God has told you and I a thing, it will become a vision on the inside of you if you truly believe it. And you will wait for it with patience. Now, that's my scripture, Romans 8, 25. I don't know about you, but it's mine. People who can quit and give up are people whose imaginations have become very, very negative. And they're seeing the negative side of their situation instead of the positive side, and they're losing hope quicker than they're walking by faith. Are you hearing today? So whether you and I know it or not, beloved, our imagination is dictating to us how our life is going to go. And if you and I are not aware of what I'm talking about and don't think that it's important, all it means is you aren't controlling, if you're not controlling your imaginations, you're being manipulated and controlled by something or someone else and you will always walk in that negative place. The only thing that you should be Controlled by is the word of Almighty God. And make that your strong word. Make that your, your, your strong defense in the time of need. Your imagination is like soil. Soil doesn't care what kind of seed you plant in it. Now, interchange what I'm saying with imagination with your heart. Because it's the same. I just read it to you. It's the same. I gave you scripture. So, whatever you're, produ whatever you're planting so in your soil, it's going to produce. It's the exact same thing with your heart and your imagination. Your imagination will conceive something and automatically start making it come to pass, whether it's positive or negative. It's kind of, I mean, this is a big statement, but it's kind of like your spiritual womb. That's what it's like. You're planting something deep, deep inside of you. And what you should be planting is the word of God for your situation. The imagination isn't moral or immoral. 
No, it's what you focus your attention on that affects it. It's what you set your heart on. You know, I love the scripture of King David. I've been reading it so much lately because I need it. When everything, all hell, as we would say, was breaking loose all around him, Saul was after him, everybody. I mean, it was a mess. And what did he do? There was nobody there for him. So the Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord. What did he say? He looked at himself and he said, Why art thou disquieted within me, O my soul? Trust thou in God. And beloved, that's where many of us are today. He had to talk to himself because you'll find out something if you live long enough. You better know how to talk to God and how to listen because you'll not always have a human being there. I mean, people will be there. They'll do the best, they, the very best they can do to help. But there comes a time, you ask any woman that's in labor, she has to do her own pushing. And that's what it's like in the spirit realm sometimes. I have to do my own pushing. Are you hearing me? You say, well, where did you get that? I said, God. I have to do my own pushing. I have to push through. Push and push and push. Because it's all I know to do. You know, Jesus himself talked to his disciples. He said, okay, this one's gone, that one's gone. This is my paraphrase. So there's the door. You want to go, go. And what did they say? They said, where can we go? Only you have the words of life. Let me tell you, beloved, that is so true in modern day life. I want to go. I feel like King David. If I had wings, I could fly away. Boy, I'll tell you, could I fly? But where am I going to go? Only Jesus has the words of life. I hope you're getting something. You're really quiet here. But I pray you're getting what God wants you to get. So the imagination isn't moral or moral. It's what we focus on. We get to choose every day to be positive, which is hope, or negative, which becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Is it easy? No. Am I putting anybody down here? Absolutely not. I'm walking in what I'm trying to teach you. i got to catch me every day and say no. You're not listening. No, you're not listening to this. No, you're not hearing this. Am I denying? No, I'm not in denial. We hear the facts, but I stand on the truth, which is God's word. That's how I feel. And no matter what happens, that's what I believe. Am I helping you today? I'm only going to be a few minutes. The Bible tells us in Psalm 34, 3, King David really can teach this because he can speak this and we can hear it because he went through it. He went through hell. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. David had the victory through praise, King David. He praised his God. In the midst of the storm, the word magnify means to enlarge. The problem isn't too big. Our concept of God, beloved, most of the time is too small. The following words are a declaration of God's greatness. Begin repeating them over and over in your circumstances every day. I try to do this myself and watch what will happen. At least you'll feel better at the end of the day. Listen to this. He is the first, the last, the beginning and the end. He is the keeper of creation, creator of the universe, manager of all time. He always was, always is, always will be. The world can't understand him. Its armies can't defeat him. Its schools can't explain him. Its leaders can't ignore him. 
Herod couldn't kill him. The Pharisees couldn't confuse him. Nero couldn't crush him. Hitler couldn't silence him. He's the power of the powerful, the ancient of days, the ruler of rulers, the leader of leaders. He is holy, mighty, and true. His ways are right, his word eternal, and his will unchanging. He is redeemer, savior, lord, and guide. And when I fall, he forgives. And this is the big one. When I am weak, he is strong. Yeah. He is strong when I am weak. When I am lost, he's the way. When I'm afraid, he's my courage. When I stumble, he said, it's me. When I'm broken, he mends me. When I face persecution, he shields me. When I face loss, he provides for me. When I face death, he carries me home. He said it, that settles it. He's on my side. And God is in control. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. I'm leaving you with this one thought. The mighty oak was once a little nut that held its ground. When you don't give up, you've always got a chance. Every head bowed, if you will. Every eye closed. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, this is the time and this is the hour. Do not hesitate. Time is short. And if you're here today and you knew the Lord for whatever reasons, hearts, wounds, disappointments, whatever, you've gone away from Him, but you came here today. And I'm saying to you by the Holy Spirit, if you can say yes to any of those Invitations, you need to get out of your seat and you need to come right up here to the altars and let me pray with you. If you say, I need Jesus, come. If you say, I need to get right with Jesus, I need to get right on the right path again, come. And I'm only giving you a couple of minutes to do it. I'm not prolonging it. But I know by the Holy Spirit, there are those in this room that need to come. Come. In Jesus' name. He said it, come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come, just kneel there. Just kneel at the altar. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone want to join her? Because I know there's more than one. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, I thank God for counsel. I thank God for all of the worldly things we can go to for help. But there's nothing like getting before God with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Make your requests known unto him. And you know what, beloved? One minute at these altars can save your life because God hears your heart anyone else before I pray thank you Father thank you Lord thank you Lord Jesus Father I pray for these two precious ones that have came to be with you this moment and I want you just to stay there and talk to God and I pray, Father God, that whatever they are requiring of you, you will grant them that desire.